Hey, everybody. Welcome back. You're listening to Podcast on Fifth Ave. It was quite the weekend for the Penguins. They had a little bit of a Ranger sandwich with uh, Detroit in the middle. Not all bad, obviously, when you score 11 goals in a game uh, and are the first team to do it in 19 years. That's pretty, pretty impressive. However, the games against New York were not cause for panic, but definitely cause for concern enough to address some things. So what what were some of our kind of key takeaways and observations from this weekend? Jenna, what, what were you feeling about all that? It was a lot. I mean, there were three, I would say three different styles of games because Friday night against the Rangers was kind of a shellacking in the first, you know, five minutes. In theory, it's over. The Rangers are up three, nothing. They're showing no signs of let, of, you know, letting down by any means. And it was interesting because coming into that game, Mike Matheson had said, this is the biggest game of the year up to this point. And like, we don't usually hear that a ton from players, which kind of I found intriguing. Usually they'll say something on those lines of, you know, oh, we're just trying to, you know, they kind of keep a steady ship. But for Matheson to kind of come out and say that, and then for them to kind of play the way that they did, it was like, all right, you knew they were going to mm-hmm. respond a little bit. And of course they responded in a huge way against Detroit. Yeah. This was the wildest stat that I read. Detroit has had games this season where they have allowed zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven goals. Wow! Yeah. Oh my word! <laughs> it's just, I mean, <laughs> wild. I, I love crazy stats like that. But you know, that was a great way wow. to respond. But then to see a little bit of what we saw on Tuesday night you kind of, uh, I mean, the Rangers look like a better team right now. There's no doubt about Mm -hmm. that. But They just did so many things. Like there were so many times last night or Tuesday night, and I'm sure you guys saw this too, but just the Rangers held the Penguins in the zone. The Penguins could not get out of their own end to start generating some offense because of the way the Rangers like to play. And the Penguins just didn't really seem to react in that way to that. They couldn't find a way to break that until the last handful of minutes where we saw probably one of the craziest, I would say, five, ten minute spans uh, at the end of a period that I've seen in a very long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the Rangers, that was, you know, the story. I mean, but they held the Penguins to, to five shots in the first period. Um, they were just so good at stifling the Penguins when they were in transition. They couldn't get cleanly out of their own zone. They couldn't create offense off, off the rush that way. And that's why they weren't getting any shots off. And, um, it's looking like this is going to be a first round matchup in the playoffs. You know, Mm -hmm. the, the hurricanes have a five, six point lead on first place. The capitals are behind. They're sitting in a wild card spot by five, six points. It's looking like it's going to be Rangers. Uh, mm-hmm. Penguins, they might keep leapfrogging each other down the stretch here. But, I mean, right now, so I don't think, you know, that that 5-1 game in New York, that's not like a playoff-type feel that we're going to see. You don't really see those kinds of blowouts in the playoffs. And yeah. more of these tight games that you see in the playoffs. And Mike Sullivan did say, you know, this is how the Penguins are going to have – they're going to have to get more comfortable playing games like this down the stretch because mm-hmm. this yeah. is a playoff-type feel. And th- this game against New York really had a, a, a playoff, you know, type feel that those close games and right now it doesn't look the penguins look like the penguins would come out on the better end of a a seven game series if this is the matchup uh they do have another meeting between the two teams april 7th that's the last time the the penguins and rangers meet in the regular season that's in new york so the penguins do have another opportunity to work out these kinks because if you know this is a playoff matchup but uh, right now, it doesn't look very encouraging, especially with Shesterkin in that. He's just outstanding. You, you figure yeah. the playoffs, he's going to steal them a game or two. Um, mm-hmm. So they're going to have to, you know, figure out, uh, you know, how to get past this team. The the Red Wings game, that, that was just insane. Uh, 11-2. I don't know how much you can take away from that. Um, the goaltending was pretty bad. Uh, Nadalgovic just – because, I mean, with the shot totals in that game, were pretty even. It was – even, yeah. I think, 35-35. So it's not like the Penguins were just, you know, dominating. It's really just like <laughs> Detroit's goaltending really let them down. So um, it was really cool to see. I don't know how much you can learn from that uh, and, you know, take moving forward. A, you know, nice response. Uh, I, I don't look at that as a response to that first New York game, uh, the second one. They still put forth a better effort in that second game against New York, but still wasn't enough. 
Yeah. It wasn't. And yeah, when you, when you look at the Penguins lineup potentially now down the stretch, there, there is going to be more flexibility because what we've been seeing, unfortunately, is that guys like Evan Rodriguez and Danton Heinen have tremendously cooled off. And that's to be expected for, for guys of their ability. They were, I, I mean, Evan Rodriguez was basically carrying the team whenever they were without some of their top names. And that was just unbelievable. But having those lines the way they were set up, not that that negates the way that the Rangers played because they absolutely did dominate the Penguins. But now that, guys like Jason Zucker and Brock McGinn are getting healthy again and returning to the lineup that will allow a little bit more depth to return to those, those um, bottom two lines and take some of the pressure off of uh, Evan Rodriguez because he really looked kind of like a fish out of water more than once in the, in the second game against New York. Unfortunately, his, his decision making was just suspect, and I think we saw that with a lot of guys. But yeah, Shesterkin is going to be their their biggest problem. He's playing so phenomenally well, and it it could potentially come down to a battle of the goaltending in in that series, which would be thrilling to watch, but also um, pretty anxiety inducing because dang, that's stressful. And I feel like we have to point out the the game winning goal in that one it came on a power play. Chris Kreider off of a pretty questionable call. I mean, so that was in the third period when that when that happened. But the penalties were at the end of the the second period. Um, it was uh, Lindgren and Gensel started you know shoving each other, exchanging words, and then Mike Matheson stepped in and and grabbed Lindgren to kind of pull him away from Gensel. He was playing the peacemaker. All three yeah. of those guys got called for roughing and. Uh, it, so I put the Penguins on on the PK to to start the third, and that's when the Rangers scored the goal that would stand as the game winner. I Sullivan, I, I asked if he was surprised, you know, that the way that the penalties were given out, and all he said was yes. Uh, Mike Matheson said he respectfully disagrees with the call. He still doesn't know why he was given the rough mm-hmm. penalty. And if you watch it back, yeah, he's not like being aggressive. He said, you know, he saw Lindgren going after one of their best players in guns when he tried to step in and just stop it. And then he gets mm-hmm. called, but he gets to the extra roughing matter for that. And then, I mean, it proves very costly. Um, so that that's kind of a sucky way to lose that game. But, yeah, we, we mentioned it before. The the push at the end, very encouraging. Penguins were, were dominant. Gensel had two really good chances, but he was, you know, robbed by Shesterkin. Um, mm-hmm. Raquel looked good in that stretch, too, at the end. And he had, you know, one of the saves of the game when, when they had the extra attacker, uh, you know, out and Jari was out that the cage was empty. Uh, it was, I think, Kreider that took a shot and he, you know, dropped a block at, uh, I saw on Instagram he had a you know bruise on I think like his his ribs after from from blocking Sheesh. that shot, but just a lot of encouraging things to take away from you know the third period and that push. But um, that's you know the kind of effort they're going to have to put forth you know moving forward mm-hmm. to beat this team. Yeah, and you heard them talk about that too. They said that they need to kind of harness that for the full 60 yeah. minutes, which I feel mm-hmm. like we have talked about a little bit. And again, they talk about that Tampa Bay game as kind of the blueprint game they want to play. If you play a game like that, and if they consistently can play that, not only for a full 60 minutes, but in a seven game series that could realistically go seven, then absolutely you have to love their chances. But how can they, or can they, play that type of hockey for a mm-hmm. full 60 minutes for a full, you know, five, six, seven game series against a very talented Rangers team with a goalie that's very difficult to beat. Although, you know, the easiest way to beat him is just continue to put pucks on net. That was something yeah. listening to the radio broadcast on my way home from work last night in the beginning of the third period. Like that was shout out to Phil Bork, but that was all he was saying. He's like, just put pucks on mm-hmm. the net. That yep. is how you beat this guy. Get those chances, you know, sh- sh- shooting off the pads. You see that a little bit mm-hmm. too, but you can't dump the puck in against a team like the Rangers because Shosturkin loves to play the puck. You can't mm-hmm. dump it in and expect that you're going to get there before he does sometimes because that's just not the style that he plays in. But, you know, seeing them as frequently as they are in this short period of time, I think really does kind of help the fact that mm-hmm. this is a team they're most likely going to see round one. 
Yeah. And my God, like with the amount of times they struggled to get the puck in the Rangers end, you can't afford to just keep passing it around or dumping it in. Like you have to be aggressive and shoot when they're clogging up center ice the way that they were that it was just there they did show signs of life there at the end like they kind of started to the wheels started to turn but it was for the most part a a more frustrating game to watch not for lack of effort but just for lack of any type of movement whatsoever if these two teams do meet up like it's looking like they will it's going to be one the hell of a series for sure. And I'm not sure if I'm looking forward to it or absolutely dreading it. I don't know. Stands to be, stands to be determined. Why don't we take a quick break and we'll be right back. And we're back. We mentioned in the first segment that Jason Zucker is pretty close to returning, and it's it's looking like he could potentially play in the game Thursday night. So that is definitely exciting for line combinations. Taylor, what what can we anticipate seeing as possible lines now that he's coming back? Yeah, so he's been – it seems like he will play in, in both of these games, Minnesota-Colorado. That, that would be my guess based off of Wednesday's practice. Sullivan said he'll be a game-time decision. I feel like that usually just means he's going to play. He Sullivan never tells us when a guy is actually just going to return. Um, but, yeah, he, he's been full contact for, for two practices now. Line combina- He took line rushes, power play, so it seems like he's going to be in. And the line combinations they used – um, they put Zucker on the, the second line with Malkin on the left wing, shifting Raquel over from left wing to right wing, which is something Raquel can do. We, we actually talked about that when Raquel came in, that Zucker, Malkin, Raquel is a line combination we might end up seeing, and that's what they did. Um, so Russ was moved back up to the first line, um, his normal spot, bumping Evan and Rodriguez down to the third line with Carter and Kapanen, bumping Dayton Heinen down to the fourth line and bumping Redeem Zahorna out of the lineup. So, uh, I mean, first impressions, this is a pretty deep uh, lineup as far as mm-hmm. four lines go. And, you know, they can get some uh, real depth scoring out of all of these four lines. And uh, But, yeah, it'll, the Zucker, Malk, and Raquel line is the one I'm most interested in seeing how those guys uh, fit together. And it's funny, too, because everybody seemed to, or at least the reactions I was, like, seeing today where it was like, oh, my gosh, we're moving Raquel. Like, oh, panic. Like, this is what he does. He's such yeah. a versatile guy. He is that type of player. That was one of the reasons they brought him in was because he can play on both wings. And he even talked about it. Was that today? Yeah, he talked about it today. I don't know. He talked about it a couple just, times. Yeah. It's something yeah. to do. Yeah, it's something he can do, and he kind of says, you know, you line up that way when you're doing face-offs and stuff, but then with the game flow and with the way that things move, like, you're moving around, you're shifting, you're not, like, stagnant in that one area. So I think, you know, for people pressing the panic button, being like, oh, my God, you're taking this guy off his natural side, it's like he is so versatile and talented that he can play yeah. both mm-hmm. and play both with I don't, ease. I don't think he has a natural side. I think people have, like – uh, like PTSD from the Jerome McGinley trade when, you know, the Penguins brought him in, put him, he had an established, established position. The Penguins, Dan Balsma put him on his offside and it didn't work, but they, they stuck with it. This is the complete opposite of the Jerome McGinley situation. Raquel can play. I mean, he started out as a center. Uh, he, he hasn't played center in a couple of years, but I mean, uh, he's played left wing and right wing pretty extensively with, with Anaheim. And he's had success on on both. It's not just that he he can do it; he's good at it. Um, he when he had the back to back thirty goal seasons, he was mostly a a left wing. Um, he had been playing mostly right though this season in Anaheim with Zegras and I, I believe Milano was the one on the other wing. And he yeah. was on pace for a, tw- a twenty goal season, you know, minimum playing on the right. So it's something he can do. And like you said. It, you know, he said that today that it, it's not something that he thinks is even going to affect that much because it's really just the face-offs. And after that, they're really just reading off of each other and moving around. Um, so uh, it's 
and something Sullivan said too about, you know, when they're looking for players who can play with Malkin, uh, he wants someone that can go to the net and, uh, you know, provide those screens, but then also look for rebounds and, and, you know, uh, deflections, stuff like that, because then, you know, it encourages, you know, someone like Malkin to, to shoot more and, you know, get more to the net when there's a, a better chance of a payoff. And Zucker and Raquel are both guys that do that. That's something that stood out about Raquel to me through these first couple of games, just his ability to go to the net. I mean, when he's on the second power play unit, he does that. Um, looking for redirections, looking for deflections, providing screens. So um, these guys have the attributes of, of wingers that can fit with Malkin. Uh, it'll just be interesting to see how they all mesh because, you know, Malkin and Zucker, they played together a bit last year. They played together in the one game in Vegas this year that they were both healthy for. Um, didn't have much overlap when they were both healthy, but uh, so it'll be interesting to see how Malkin fits with both of those guys and how they work with each other. Yeah, hopefully we see some chemistry. But, yeah, like you said, his Raquel's net front presence is just Oh my goodness, it's just incredible to see that. And he's generated such good chances from that position, even though he only has one goal so far only. Like he he has really clicked pretty pretty immediately. And it's that's something that's awesome to see because it feels like he's kind of the the style of winger that Malkin's been missing. So looking ahead to the games. Thursday against Minnesota in Minnesota, and then Saturday against Colorado. What what are some things that we can look for in these in these matchups, and hopefully see the Penguins do really well against these teams? Yeah, I mean, these, I mean no, no, no. Go ahead, go ahead. I, mean, I was going to say, yeah, these are two of the top teams in the West, uh, Colorado the top team in the league, the first team to reach 100 points. They're, they might be without McKinnon, it seems. Like, McKinnon, he is injured. He did not play on Tuesday. Um, it's a hand injury that stems from – possibly stems from a fight on Sunday. Um, and uh, Bednar said that the level of concern they have regarding the injury is high, which means, you know, if you look at mm-hmm. the Saturday, he might not be in the lineup, which obviously a massive loss, but – Still, that's a pretty that's a deep team even without McKinnon. Uh, the Wild, they're I believe they sit third in the Central right now. Another one of or no second in the Central, third in the West. So another top team, and now they have Flurry. So the you know you have to figure they're going to face uh, Flurry, uh, which should be interesting. Mm-hmm. We talked about it before how the Capitals wanted to acquire Flurry, but Flurry kept saying like no, <laughs> uh, he didn't have a no movement clause. But you know the Blackhawks are just being respectful and letting him kind of decide where he wanted to go and. Flurry said it wouldn't have felt right to face the Penguins as a member of the Capitals, but it looks like he's going to face them as a member of the Wild, at least um, on Thursday. So that's going to be something to watch out for, uh, Flurry, obviously. But yeah, these are going to be two more, you know, playoff type games for the Penguins, mm-hmm. which is going to be really good, um, like practice, you know, down the stretch, because as we're well, less than a month left in the season now. So wow. yeah. yeah, these are going to be two real, real big tests. Mm-hmm. It's crazy because if you look at their next 14 games, the way there's almost like a definitive split, the next six in a row are against playoff teams because you face Minnesota, then you face Colorado on the road, then Colorado comes home, then you see the Rangers again, then you see the Preds, if I'm doing the math right, something along those lines. But then on the bottom, the back half of that, and granted, then, you know, we're in April, mid April at this point, but then you face, I think, the only the three of their last eight after that are only against playoff teams. So you face, mm. it's a back-to-back or a home and home with Boston and then Edmonton and even Edmonton. Are they still in the bubble? I, they're like teetering right around. They're like third or fourth in their yeah. division. Um, so there's just like a drastic, drastic line here. Um, yeah. But this is something they wanted to say that they wanted to see right now. You know, you mm-hmm. want to be playing these types of games. You want to be facing these types of teams as you move down the stretch. Mm -hmm. Because when you play teams like this, they can expose things that need to be exposed before it is do or die. And it's, it's really helpful for them to get, get a handle on what needs to be addressed come end of April, beginning of May, because that is rapidly approaching. I can't even believe that we're already at this point 
in the season. That's that's just nuts that we're talking about playoffs. But yeah, this this next little road trip is going to be a whole lot of fun uh, watching them face off against Flurry and then take on the best team over in the West. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we'll see what they can do with it's- that. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see which games Casey DeSmith gets in mm. uh, just this last month yeah. because, you know, you can't ride Jari for the last month of the season. DeSmith's going to have to get into yeah. these games. And the, the you know, level of difficulty in the schedule is going to be, you know, tough. I think the only back-to-back they have is, you know, Philly and Detroit, and that's one that, you know, put Casey to Smith in for both of them. Yeah. They're going to win. But um, yeah. you know, some of these tougher games, they're not back to back, but you're going to have to get yeah. Casey into some of them. And that's another one where, you know, it might expose, you know, what they have backup goaltending. It's like, it's been up and down all season. Yeah. Um, you know, he's, he's had a couple of re- stretches where he looks really good. And then some were uh, really struggling, but, you know, once the Penguins are, you know, healthy and everyone's on off, off LTIR, they don't have room to carry around like Louis Domingue. So that's something you can rule out where they bring up Louis Domingue, let him get in some of these games to see what they have. They're going to have to, you know, ride with Casey for, for yeah. some of these games. It's just going to be interesting to see how they decide which ones you put them in. Yeah. 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 And also coming into the Minnesota game, Minnesota's won seven in a row at this point. <laughs> so oh. this is uh, – they're they're riding the hot hand, but also it's kind of one of those. Okay, if they're looking, you know, they're looking really good, but also at some point you have to lose. Yep, I think so. Logic, <laughs> you know, yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> stands like to reason. But yeah, it'll it'll definitely be um, wild. Why don't we take another break and we'll be right back. We're back. I know that we talked right after the Pens traded for Ricard Raquel that he had a dog and his dog's name is Heinz. And we just thought that that was the most delightful thing. But it was confirmed Tuesday that Wednesday, what day is it today? Doesn't matter. You're listening to this on (laughs) Thursday. That's all that matters. It was confirmed this week that when Ricard Raquel got his dog, his dog's name was already Heinz. And it wasn't just that this dog was named after Heinz Ketchup. This dog was named after Heinz Field. Heinz freaking Field in Pittsburgh. How perfect is that? Yeah, I mean, like like you said, so he didn't name the dog. He got it from a breeder. So he, he has two black labs. The first one is Stella. He and his wife got Stella as a puppy. Um, and then they got... Heinz from the same breeder when when Heinz was a year old so he, he was already named and yeah he said they asked the breeder you know how did he get his name uh Heinz Field which is just wild it feels like he was destined to be a penguin uh mm-hmm. with that uh I he so he, but he's not a Steelers fan I you know I when they traded for him and like we were waiting on the return for what felt like two hours I was like creeping his like Twitter Instagram just like figuring out what I can about this guy I think he's a Lions fan and he actually did have a picture at Heinz Field where he was cheering for the Lions. Hmm. So, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but Heinz, yeah, Heinz Field, how perfect is that? It's just uh, wild stuff. His, so his dogs aren't currently in Pittsburgh. They are back in Anaheim. His wife is very pregnant, so she did not move with him to Pittsburgh. Um, she's due in June. Cutting it pretty close if the mm-hmm. Penguins are going to make a deep run. Um, if they play the Rangers, I'm sure he'll be back in time. But uh, that's where, you know, the dogs are right now. But uh, he said he hopes Heinz can join him one day. So if he resigns, maybe Heinz can, can visit Heinz Field. Oh. We need that video. Mm-hmm. Like, I need that the Penguins social team and the Steelers social, social team to make that happen. We need, mm-hmm. like, just like a dog day at Heinz Field. But, like, Heinz, like, can we put, like, a crown on him at Heinz Field? Would that be – I think that's very fitting and very yeah. appropriate. Yeah. Um, he needs need to be that. given some kind of royal something, dressing. Yeah. There's so many good dogs on, on the Penguins. What he, Rust, I th- he has, like, two Goldens, I think. And they all have their own Instagram page. Uh, Dumoulin, I think, has an English bulldog named Rue. Uh 
<laughs> Carl Aston Reese, what a loss that was in the trade. <laughs> the Italian Greyhound. Mm-hmm. Aston Reese used to dress him up in clothes, but it's like what Jari has two big dogs. I can't remember what they are, but uh, yeah. a lot of good dogs around. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah, the. <laughs> Raquel's two black labs. What what an, uh, mm-hmm. an addition that was! Oh my god, it's just like I mean, amazing. We we need to know like I need to know the breeder's backstory. Mm-hmm. Like, did she? Did she just like are they Steelers fans or a Steelers fan? Did they grow up in Pittsburgh? Like, we always say there's always a Pittsburgh connection, but like my goodness, there has to be. I think we need to get if we do get to get back in locker rooms at any point, we just need to like pull Ricard Raquel aside and be like, okay, so like. Are they a Steelers fan? Did they just do that? Did they just name it? Because they were like, oh, you know, the Steelers are on right now. Heinz. Or like, what's the backstory here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, whatever whatever the backstory is, the vibes are immaculate. And you know what else is like immaculate vibes? These t- shirts that they just keep making and showing up in. Like the big Boyle shirt and then mm-hmm. the Mark Friedman is Lord Farquaad shirt. Like who's coming up with these ideas And where are they getting them made? Like, what is going on? It's just, I I could not possibly love it more. So my my understanding is that the t-shirts are being made by the equipment staff. I think specifically John Taglianetti, the head equipment manager. Mm. Um, The the equipment staff, they do have, you know, an Instagram account. And they, he posts, you know, hot off the press. And it's a big boil shirt. That was the first one. (laughs) It just boils head on. Uh, it was like, what was it? Chase Claypool's body. Like, I don't think we ever got an answer yeah. for why. Um, and then the newest one, Zucker comes in. He, I just see him walking in for his media availability, and I see the shirt. I'm like, oh my god! Like, Lord Farquaad, who is the very tiny uh, ruler of Duloc from Shrek, with Mark Friedman's face on it, and like a 52 on the, on, you know, the shoulder, oh my god. and then like Lord Farquaad under it, and. Um, you, you know, we asked, you know, when Russ comes in in the big boil shirt and when Zucker, you know, I asked Zucker, they don't, they, they're not telling us like why the, the designs are what they are, but the common thread is that it seems like they don't know how they're getting around the locker room. I mean, it's, so it's definitely the equipment staff making them, but they're like, yeah, they it just showed up in my locker. So the hours the equipment staff is already putting in, it's crazy. If you yeah. see like how late those guys are at the arena, how early they get there, they're apparently making t-shirts also staying later and then just slipping them in a guy's lockers. Uh, oh. Like I know like Russ with the boil one, he's like, yeah, I had to get my hands on one. So it's not like every guy gets one, but you know, <laughs> oh my goodness. if you're lucky, I think it shows up in your uh, locker. I did see on Wednesday um, – John Taglianetti, he was wearing one of the Lord Farquaad shirts oh on God. the bench of practice, which further supports the idea that, you know, these are coming from him. Oh, I love Crazy. that. I, it's an incredible yeah. shirt. Mm-hmm. Like, that one alone. I think, like, Big Boyle was amazing. I This one just is, like, that next notch up. Like, it's mm-hmm. everything about it is just perfectly on brand. Yeah, and the... The more answers you get or don't get, the more questions you have, because I just, I really, the inspiration behind that, whatever genius mind it designed or dreamt that up, was that like a fever dream? Was that something that came to somebody in a vision, Mark Friedman on top of Lord Farquaad? I just, I would love to know how that idea was birthed because it, it just, how and why, but thank you. Like- I just feel yes. very blessed. We're all blessed. I I do think it's funny. You know, when, you know, Friedman comes in, obviously there's animosity between him and his Flyers teammates. And, you know, fans ask, I get like comments on stories and on Twitter, like how do, how do you know, the Penguins teammates feel about Mark Friedman? Do they get along? Do they like him? Is he actually a jerk? And I think, you know, Zucker coming in with wearing a shirt with Mark Friedman's face on it kind of answers your question. They love him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You ask any of them about Mark Friedman. It's like they, they break, they smiled. Tristan Jari uh, on his own says he's, you know, a great teammate. So uh, I don't know what happened in Philly, but they they love him so much in Pittsburgh that they put him on a t-shirt. So amazing. Uh, John Marino's just, favorite teammate. Yeah. John Marino's favorite teammate. Or sorry, but, favorite hockey player, not even favorite teammate, favorite <laughs> hockey player. You're right. How did you forget? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I the the t-shirts the 
the first t-shirt though remember the stick boy t-shirt that was that was last season the way this started the t-shirt you yeah. know printing business started that um was when crosby broke his stick and you know the equipment got tagging that he made the handoff right to him uh and then he scored with that stick and it was on you know sports center top 10 espn whatever and and then the Penguins were all wearing T-shirts with like a silhouette of that moment that said "Stick Boy," uh, and I believe that came from the equipment staff making oh their own God, T-shirts. But, so that's how that started. So this does go back to last season, but it's just on a new level this season. Uh, I'd love to see what you, teams always come out with playoff shirts with a weird, you know, designs. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd love to see what, what the seasons are because <laughs> I don't, again, I don't know how they come up with these. Yeah, it, I just can't wait for them. I hope they keep doing this for the for the rest of the year. Maybe for the rest of ever. If they could just keep this up, that would be fine by me. Love that. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening to Podcast on Fifth Ave. We're so glad that you, you're here. Uh, we drop new episodes every Thursday, so make sure that you're subscribed wherever it is you listen to podcasts. We're on all the different platforms. We also are on YouTube, so if you want the video as well, you can subscribe there. But we will see you next week for another episode. Bye.